Fox Sports. We are Fox Sports. We are Ohio. Well, Mother Nature is in a far better mood tonight. It is a beautiful evening in downtown Baltimore, and we welcome you to Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Game two of this three-game series between the Cincinnati Reds and the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles coming away with a one-run win here last night. And hi again, everybody, alongside Chris Welsh and Jim Day, Tom Brenneman. Delighted to have you with us on this Wednesday night. And delighted to get another look at Dylan Axelrod. This is a young man who's made a pair of starts so far for the Reds this year, Chris. And I know you've been very impressed. Well, you should be very, very impressed because, Tom, what he lacks in velocity and overall stuff, he makes up with command. And he's got good command of all of his pitches. He gets a lot of outs on fastballs that don't seem to go above 90 miles an hour. But he's a little got some deception there. He also has a very good changeup. In fact, he throws two different kinds of changeups. But as long as he's throwing the ball where he wants, Suit. He'll hit those zones and let hitters get themselves out. And so far, it's a formula that's worked for him. Tell you what, it's been a very impressive year for his counterpart tonight, Miguel Gonzalez. Well, you're not kidding about that. It, like Axelrod, he's not on his first team, but he has done a very good job uh, with the Orioles. He was up with the Orioles last year. You know, if you look at the numbers on Gonzalez, his numbers are always very impressive. His earned run average in the threes. He, again, like Axelrod, is not overpowering. But he does throw all four pitches, a couple different kinds of fastball, slider, curveball, and an occasional changeup. He gets a lot of swings and misses with that changeup, a splitter. So you're going to look at tonight a couple of right-handers that like that off-speed pitch as their go-to pitch. All right, Reds trying to even this series. We'll have all the action when we come back. Reds and the Orioles, first pitch from Baltimore, coming up next. Local Ford dealer. Ford, go further. By Cincinnati USA Regional Tourism Network. Stay close to CincinnatiUSA.com. And by Skyline Chili. Feeling good? It's Skyline time. I'm Jim Day on the field just outside of the Reds dugout. 
Many people thought that, well, the Baltimore Orioles were perhaps going to fall apart in the second half, and one of those big, big teams, as you know, the Yankees in particular, might catch them. But if you check out our IGS Bringing the Energy feature, you will see best records since the All-Star game. And Baltimore on top, 28 and 15, along with Kansas City. The first four teams are teams right in the thick of things. And look at the San Diego Padres, 25 and 17. They've certainly had a terrific second half. But Baltimore, 28 and 15, much of the reason why they have a big, big lead right now in the American League East standings. Well, you're not lying about that, Jim. Do you look at Baltimore, a whopping nine and a half game lead over the second place Yankees in the American League East. They won their 80th game of the year here last night. And what a job the entire staff top to bottom has done with the Baltimore Orioles including their manager Buck Showalter. Yankees lost last night to the Boston Red Sox Baltimore beating the Reds here by a run in the series opener. We look at the Reds starting lineup under their manager Brian Price presented by Meyer. Hamilton in center Frazier at first Phillips at second Mesoraco catching Bruce and right Ludwig to DH tonight. A ladder third of Skip Schumacher in left, Christopher Negron at third, and once again Ramon Santiago in place of Zach Cozart celebrating the birth of a child just a, a day ago. Congratulations to the Cozarts. They'll be rejoining the team, I'm sure, over the weekend. And on the mound, making his 22nd start, pitched in one game out of the bullpen. Been on a real good roll since. The month of July is Miguel Gonzalez. You know, it's amazing how the Orioles have kind of a patchwork quilt of different pitchers and players that come in. A lot of them have having great years that no one expected to have great years. And I would say that Miguel Gonzalez is one of those. Born in Mexico, raised in California. Young man that is now 30 years old, originally not drafted. He was picked up as a non-drafted free agent by the Los Angeles Angels. That was back in 2005 when he was 21 years old. But he's worked his way up the ladder in minor league baseball, and he's done a very fine job. Now it is second real year as being a starter here with the Orioles. He had 28 starts last year. His record was 11 and 8. You see what he's done here so far in 64 starts. In his career, I mean, those are very good numbers. That career 3.5 ERA, eight games over 500. That is, uh, that's a key thing there. All right, Billy Hamilton digging in. We're set to go. Hamilton was on base three times last night, scored a run, had a couple of hits, and set a Reds franchise record, picking up his 55th stolen base in this his rookie year. He takes up an in ball one and we're underway. Well, what a beautiful night it is. Eighty one degrees our game time temperature tonight. Jim Day looks very comfortable down there alongside the Reds dugout. He and I had a little friendly wager of the first pitch game time temperature tonight. Oh you did. How'd you do. I thought it was going to start in the sevens. He said in the eights. Well, and maybe he squeaks should. by again. Maybe you should wait till this weekend. Don't say anything to him, and you know wager him again because I understand the temperatures in Cincinnati be mighty nice for Reds baseball mm, this weekend. Gonna be a great weekend. Come on down to the ballpark. We invite you to check out the Reds and the Mets beginning Friday night. J.J. Hardy backhand cuts it loose. Good play by Hardy back in the lineup after missing the last couple of games. With back spasms, and we look at the Orioles defensively, presented by your four dealers. Nelson Cruz goes over to left field tonight. Marquez was a DH last night. He's in right. Adam Jones in the lineup as a DH, but not in center. Johnson, his first start as an Oriole after making his debut last night. By making that debut, it's interesting to note. That Kelly Johnson is the first player ever to play for each of the five teams that reside in the American League's Eastern Division. We saw him earlier this year, you may remember, with the New York Yankees.
And I mean, it's happened right now. Three teams alone this year in the division after wow. playing for Tampa Bay last season. That ball smoked it hard. Two down. Hardy had some back problems very early in the month of April and they were concerned this might be something that would you know continue to occur over and over and over and it wasn't until just over the weekend. Final day of August first day of September. That back started barking again but he's in there tonight. And when you've got a nine and a half game lead in your division you can give your guys an extra day or two. This will be one, two, and three. Go the Reds in the opening inning. Dylan Axelrod will try and answer that when the Orioles bat when we return. Inning and let's take a look at Buck Showalter's starting lineup presented by Meyer. Marquez in right, Wolf in center, and Jones the DH tonight. Nelson Cruz, a major league leader, 36 home runs. He'll be in left. Davis at first, Hardy at short, Johnson, Joseph, Scope the latter third. Dylan Axelrod came over from the White Sox and is now making his third start at the big league level for the Reds. Well he started a lot last year he ended up four and eleven with a very high earned run average with the White Sox last year he was down in their minor leagues he did pretty well in Charlotte that's where the triple A franchise is and then he went eight and nine in his starts with the Louisville bats. But he's pitched a couple of very good games here for the Reds one of Colorado on August the 17th the follow up. About 11 days later when he pitched against the Cubs at home five innings of two hit no run baseball but in each of those games he ran his pitch count up rather quickly. He'd like to be a little more efficient tonight but overall the results for Axelrod so far have been pretty good. Mark Higgins first pitch swinging a tapper down to Frazier he'll wave off his pitcher one pitch one out. That's more pitch efficient. He's like that. I like that. Reds on defense brought to you by your four dealers. Schumacher back out there in left field tonight. Same infield we saw in the game, and once again, Mesoraco hanging aside. Strike one on the outside corner. Axelrod traded to the Reds on July the 16th in exchange for cash. Reported to Louisville wearing five starts. Chris mentioned went two and one and a very fine ERA. There's a line drive caught by Hamilton in the first two retired in the Orioles first inning. Pitched 35 and a third innings for the bats allowed 27 hits and only walked five batters in those 35 and a third innings fanning 24. 
He had a game down there against Rochester shortly after coming over, about 10 days after coming over, a complete game, two hit shutout, and a 1 0 win. Four time All Star Adam Jones looks at a strike. And swung on and fouled off out of play. Earlier today, the Cardinals beat the Pirates again. Boy, the Cardinals are rolling. One nothing. The final in that one today, St. Louis going into play today. A two game lead over the sliding Milwaukee Brewers, who have lost seven consecutive games. The Brewers will be teeing them up in a little less than an hour from now once again at Wrigley Field in Chicago. That was a walk off win by the Cardinals. They didn't score that run until the bottom of the ninth inning. A scoreless duel between Edinson Volquez and Shelby Miller. It looks like Volquez might be finally putting it all together. Threw the ball very well against the Reds last weekend. In fact, it was the Pirate closer, Mark Melanson, who ended up getting tagged with a loss in that game. Jones gone swinging, and what a good start for Mr. Axelrod. We go to the second, no score. Live look ins, instant replay, score, stats, audio, and free MLB.tv game of the day and more. Download the app from the App Store or visit Reds.com today. I'm Jim Day. We told you that Zach Cozart and his wife Chelsea, uh, Chelsea gave birth to their first son, Connor, earlier this week. Now, he was back in uh, Cincinnati on Monday in the off day, Cozart, and he went in and got examined because he was having some trouble with his wrist. And they found out he's got a little inflammation in that wrist. They were expecting him back tomorrow and be in the starting lineup tomorrow. But the trainers have said that he is unavailable to play. So there's no real reason to fly him here and just sit him on the bench. So don't expect Zach Cozart to be here. He will rejoin the Reds on Friday at home. Tom. All right. Once more congratulations to Chelsea Zach on the arrival of young Connor Cozart. Cooper. Oh, I thought he said Connor. Jim Day. Clear us up, Jim. I misspoke, Tom. 
It is Cooper. All right. Well, then I apologize. This, this youngster is going to forever, forever hold this against me. All right. Well, please, Chelsea and Zach, don't hold it against me. Oh. That's our fault. So, Cooper yeah. Cozart, congratulations. No problem. It's a great name. It really is. I tell you, it's really Miss Cozart around here is Heisey. Those two are almost inseparable. Mm -hmm. No matter where you go, the Reds are on the road. Those two guys are hanging out. Best of friends. And no doubt Chris is extremely excited for Zach and Chelsea. Three and one to Devin Mezzarocco. Scoreless game as we begin the second inning. And that's a fastball strike on the inside corner. That's a pretty good 3 1 location right there. And that's strike three call. So Mezzarato takes a 3 1 pitch for a strike and a 3 2 pitch for a strike. You know, I really think that both of these pitchers are great examples of not having great stuff, but being able to get the job done because there's a certain amount of deception in their delivery and the way the ball comes out of their hand. I mean, you could tell right there that Devin Mezzarocco didn't see that last pitch at all. And he's had too many good games, Miguel Gonzalez has, for you just to erase it away and say, well, he's just lucky. I mean, he started 28 times last year and has earned around average in this division under 3.8. And that's why, Chris, when you and I got into the topic a little bit, very briefly last night, as it's 1 0 on Jay Bruce. Jay hit the grand slam here in the game last night, the third of his major league career. You know, when you talk about do they have the dominant, you know, the, the Randy Johnson or Justin Verlander of years gone by or that number one guy that going into the playoffs. You know Clayton Kershaw. That can just go out and dominate a team. Well maybe they don't but I know one thing every time we're looking at some of the starters numbers. Everybody's ERA is like three and a half or less pitching in the American League. Well yeah you're right and you know what really I think part of that is a better defense is now a better placement of defenses but that helps a guy who's more of a contact pitcher too. You pitch to a scouting report, and there's going to be somebody there with a ball over the glove to retrieve it. Like right there, short right field. Well, you teed that one up. I mean, this ball is just hit like a bullet. That's been a hit for a hundred years. Not anymore. Yeah. Of course, it helps when you have a second baseman with a shortstop's arm, and that's what Scope is out there. I mean, he has a gun. Ryan Ludwig, the designated hitter tonight, 247 batting average, eight home runs, and 41 runs batted in. Ryan one hit over his last 19 at bats including a season high 0 for 16 skid that came to an end Sunday in Pittsburgh. And he's behind here at no balls and two strikes you know he'd like to. You know, try to find a way. To finish his final month of the season on a higher note. And you wonder will this be the last year we'll see Ryan Ludwig in a red uniform they have an option on him the club does for 2000. And 15. I got to believe maybe as early as tomorrow, but certainly uh, in a number of games coming up, Chris, part of that decision is if not him, then who? They've seen Chris Heisey over the last number of years. They have seen Skip Schumacher, although he wasn't brought here to play every day. He knows that. And the Reds know that. So when will we see Jorman Rodriguez? We should talk about that at length when we come back. <laughs>
I was a, a reliever in college and uh, with the Padres and uh, independent ball, they let me start. So that was really the best thing for me. I think uh, I just got to throw all my pitches and really just work on uh, my craft. So uh, in, in the end, I, I don't think I'd be where I, where I am without being released and uh, having that opportunity to uh, just develop. Tom, that's kind of what you were talking about, about somebody who is a late bloomer, who gets a chance to refine his skills. And that's what happened with him. I mean, he was a very late round pick, like 30th round uh, with the Padres, which at that point, teams are filling out their rosters, trying to get some guys, take a shot at him. After a few years with them, he gets released. He gets, he's got nowhere to play. He happens to be near Fort Wayne, Indiana, not too far from Chicago, and gets hooked up with an independent team there called the Windy City Rollers or whatever they're called. And they give them they gave him a chance to pitch. And that's where he began to learn how to pitch. And he saved his career. Here he is pitching in the major leagues again. And quite well. Quite well. He strikes out Nelson Cruz, the home run leader in Major League Baseball, on three straight pitches. Now he's going to move that ball around in his glove until he finds a good slider grip, and that means you get a spot on on the seam where you can put your middle finger and just put a lot of pressure on it, pull that baby straight down, and that ball will just dive away from the right-handed hitter. You know, Chris, you bring up that topic, and and I don't know of any job there is out there, or of anything there is out there, where you're going to get better at it without doing it. You're right. And so if you're a pitcher, the only way to become a better pitcher is to pitch. There's a ground ball to first. It sounds so elementary. And everybody's, you know, throwing stuff at the TV going, well, no kid. Well, you really wonder, and I've wondered for years, and I'm not suggesting for a second that I'm right, but I've just wondered for years how many guys, if they really got the chance, to not be relievers. Now, you put guys in a bullpen for reasons. We understand that. But maybe if organizations, especially in this day and age of specialization, if they stay with guys a little longer as a starter, even if ultimately down the road they want them to be a reliever, just so they can work on their craft. When's yeah. the last time you think J.J. Hoover, and I'm just picking him out of a hat, here's a guy that had a great year last year and has had a really rough year this year. We know that. But this is a talented young guy. Mm -hmm. But now the bullpen, you're not throwing in between outings. Chris, how do you get better? Well, you have to throw bullpens to get better. You, you repeat it. And for J, for JJ, that may be a different a different story there because he has had success. But take the young kid growing up that wants to play on the big time travel team, but he's not quite good enough to make the starting. Nine or the starting 12, including the pitchers, but he gets to travel all over the place, but he doesn't really get to play very much. Or a kid that decides to go to a big time college when he really ought to be going to a Division three or a junior college somewhere where he doesn't get to play at a D1, but he should have been somewhere else where he can play. Those are the decisions you make along the way, that you're absolutely right. You only get better when you play. And I tell you what, he is looking mighty sharp here tonight. He has struck out three of the first six.
It's the Reds and Orioles on Fox Sports Ohio. I'm Jim Day. One of the unique things here at Oriole Park are plaques designating home runs hit out of the stadium here onto Utah Street. You were looking at former Red Paul O'Neill and one of his shots with the Yankees. In fact, there's a former Red flare out here because Adam Dunn has a couple of them. Upwards of 80 of these plaques out here on Utah Street. Adam Dunn hit one with the White Sox and here with the Nationals. But the most famous of which, Ken Griffey Jr., the only one in an organized event to hit the warehouse. He did it in the home run derby, a massive shot. Well, you're not lying about that. That is indeed a massive shot. Hey, Jim Day's all over the place Quite here at Oriole Park he? at Camden Yard. Well, he ought to be. You know, we only get here about once every four or five years. I think the Reds, this was the last team the Reds played when the first time through all of the interleague play games. They've played the most games and they finally got to Camden Yard. It was the last place that they hadn't been to. And of course, now that they've added a new ballpark in Minnesota, the Reds have not been there either up at Target Field. Which Target Field is where they played Major League Baseball's All Star Game this summer, and Cincinnati, Ohio's Great American Ballpark will be the home of the Midsummer Classic in 2015. Already excited about that. Christopher Negron looks at a strike. Good to see he's all right. He was shaken up during the game last night. Stayed in the game. This ballpark opened on April the 6th in 1992, and it was indeed a new era of Major League Baseball where the park was brand new but still old fashioned, state of the art, yet very quaint ballpark. They grown gone on strikes and that's eight straight retired by Miguel Gonzalez. A one time railroad center. And of course only two blocks from the birthplace of baseball's most legendary hero. George Herman Babe Ruth Ruth's father. Operated Roos Cafe on the ground floor of the family residence. Located on the corner of Conway Street and Little Paca. Now that is center field of this ballpark. When they opened it, the ballpark seated over 48,000. They whittled it down to a little more than 45,000 now. Have you been to the Babe Ruth Museum? I have over not. Over here. Have you been over there? No, I'm going to try to get over there tomorrow. Are you? Did you go over to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland today? I did. The fighting men and women of the U.S. Navy. Boy, that is one impressive place. That's the big leagues. You're not kidding about that? Boy, so is man. West Point. So is the Air Force Academy. The big leagues. We saw the assembly that they have right before they go to lunch. They assemble all the freshmen and they get them on the, in the courthouse right in front of the main building there where they serve their lunches. And they're, they come to attention and they're all dressed out and they march. And I'm telling you what, it is some kind of impressive. There's ball four. First base runner for either team in the game tonight. Tell you what. Ramon Santiago, you might want to nickname him Salary Drive. Because if you look his at his career numbers, the month of September is always his best month. And right now, in the last two weeks, he has he's hitting over about 450. He's on base about 50% of the time. I mean, he's not playing all that much. In the last 20 at bats, I think he's got something like eight or nine hits. But I mean he had a hit last night. He was on twice. He's taking advantage of what little playing time he's been able to get. Well, I'll tell you what, even back to when he initially got some playing time, you may remember after really not playing at all, almost the entire first, what, two months, month and a half of the season, then he 
had a chance after Brandon Phillips was injured played very very well. I don't think it's a stretch to say of the utility players over the last number of years the Reds have brought in and there have been a number of them. But Santiago this year has probably been the best of that entire bunch. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sounded like he broke his bat. Maybe not. That fastball ran in on the hands of Hamilton. Nope. Must not have. You know, Tom, you're talking about the long building here, the warehouse building in right field at Camden Yards. They just got a text from our good friend David Scott, who wanted us to know that Longworth Hall in Cincinnati is the matching building to that one. And the western terminus of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is Longworth Hall. How about that? It's good stuff, David. Thank you. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, you, it almost looks like the exact same building. Yeah. One ball and two strikes on Hamilton. Two out, one on. No score. We're in the third. The home plate umpire tonight. He thought it was up and away. Canelk, serious lawyers for serious injuries. Call 1 800 Elk, Ohio. Now, a lot of times you hear about July the 1st. Who's in first place? Take a look at the National League and my how things have changed. Atlanta, a half game lead, now six and a half back. Milwaukee, six and a half up, two and a half down. Dodgers, one back, two and a half up. Wonder when the last time that happened. We'll give you the American League here in a minute. Strike one on the outside corner to Kelly Johnson.
Dylan Axelrod. Six up, six down. Has struck out three of the six to begin the game. We're scoreless in the bottom of the third inning. Earlier, Johnson on his third different team this year inside the American League East. But now he's played with all five of them. I guess if you're going to make a final stop over the course of a single season among three teams, you can't beat wrapping things up going to the division leader. That's for sure. Plus you have all the secrets of the teams that you just left. I mean you know all their signals. You know all maybe the, some of their. You know inner workings so that when you have your team meeting here and believe me I mean Buck Showalter. Would be the kind of manager that would certainly want to debrief. Kelly Johnson. Nice snag. Real nice snag by Santiago. Well, he hits his ball right on the button and a well placed defense. You, know, you bring up Showalter. You know, through the years, Showalter certainly built the reputation of a guy who, you know, maybe had his fingers on the on the pulse of everything and wouldn't delegate anything. And I'll tell you one thing. This guy knows how to manage a baseball game. I saw him every day those first three years with the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. And for that team at that time, there is no doubt he was the right man for the job because he is on top of his game. Nice butted head with, you know, Steinbrenner there near the end. They, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they lost that, that heartbreaking. Division series, you may remember going back to 1995. That's a, everybody remembers Ken Griffey Jr. sprinting around from first base to score the winning run in the bottom of the ninth inning. That was the last game that Buck Showalter managed for the New York Yankees. When his contract expired at the end of that season, Jerry Colangelo, the owner of the Diamondbacks, called him at 12:01 and nailed him down to a contract to come to Arizona two years before they started playing. So, away in the inning. so when you get it two years before it, the team is scheduled to play, I mean, you need to start from the ground up, right? I mean, you write the book Everything. on how you want the organization to be run, and not only you know how you want the minor leagues to be taught infield and what they're batting and so, on, but how you wear your uniforms and what the color of those uniforms ought to be. I mean, he was really involved in everything, right? Every decision that was made. And of course, you were brought on board a year before. Two years. I two was years with him. Before. Yeah. So you worked hand by hand, uh, side by side with Buck. We were in an office building, yeah. and uh, about the, I don't even remember what floor was on. That's where I met my wife. We were three of the first 20 people in the whole organization. Why they were building what was then known as Bank One Ballpark, now Chase Field. Ooh. But I mean to tell you, he was 24/7. That's been close for a while. No question about it. Well, foul wide of third. I want to get back to that American League thing real quick about, you know, where they were on July the 1st. I would bet this is the first time ever in baseball where a team that was in first place on July the 1st, not one of them was in first place on September the 1st. Not one. Well, since expansion, you're probably right. I, I mean, you know, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the new divisions. We told you in the National League, Atlanta was, now they're not. Milwaukee was, now they're not. Giants were, now they're not. Same old true in the American League. Take a look at this. Toronto was one game ahead of Baltimore. Toronto's in third now. Detroit, four and a half up, now back. And the A's, three and a half up, a whopping five back after losing earlier today. Stunning. Launch deep into the night. One nothing Baltimore. 
That guy's got some pop. Go Palmers for the second straight game of this series. Well, a 3 2 pitch, and you can see where Devin Mazzarocco set up down and away. The ball just kind of floated thigh high on the inner part of the plate. The scope is right there. He had a home run in his first at bat in the second inning last night. He gets it in his first at bat in the third inning tonight. Back to the top of the order and Nick Markakis. Well, that is for scope. That is his 14th home run. That's not bad for a ninth hitter. Of course, you don't get that in the National League, but still, I mean, even in the American League, you put a little thread down there at the bottom of the lineup. Pitcher's kind of thinking, all right, I can relax just a little bit down here, seven, eight, nine, make a bad pitch to that guy, and he hits it 450 feet. Two and one on Nick Marcakis. Jam shot pop up short right field, and this will retire the side, but not before Scope for a second consecutive game. Homer's in his first at bat of the game. One nothing Baltimore. Into the batter's box last night in Florence had his number 14 retired by the freedom. The Blue Jackets recently had an offseason fan gathering called Cannon Fest up in Columbus. Plus what changes have the Ohio State Buckeyes made for their upcoming game against Virginia Tech. It's all at FoxSportsOhio.com. Urban Meyer coming out earlier today saying today his team's not ready for Virginia Tech. Said that yesterday after practice. He said, We'll see where they stand after Wednesday and Thursday. Does anybody ever pay attention to a football coach's college or pro midweek press conference? There are a couple really? of guys you do, and one of them is a head coach at LSU. That guy, when he has press conferences, if I had a little time to kill, I'd sit around and watch him. Because he is floating around everywhere. But everybody else is reading off the same teleprompter. Yeah. But Les Miles, he's an Ohio boy, you know, Les Miles. Although one of those Ohio guys who went to Michigan. So, take from that what you will.
course, some of the greatest players in the history of the University of Michigan. Kale from the state of Ohio. Desmond Howard comes to mind. That pitch taken away. Two balls and a strike to Todd Frazier. Reds down 1 0 after the home run by Stoke. And that ball's hit hard by Frazier. Back to the track and making the grab up against the wall, Marquez. Now, this is a ballpark where right handers can have a pretty good go at it when they hit the ball with some authority to right field. It really goes here. Very much like it does in Great American Ballpark back in Cincinnati. It's a nice play out there. It's a nice player. He has been a rock solid player for this team for a long time. Now, Brandon. He flied out to the center fielder, ending a 1 2 3 first inning. Reds have one base runner. That was a two out walk to Ramon Santiago in the third. Pulled foul. One ball and one strike. Now we were talking about some of the division leaders around Major League Baseball and how so much has changed just since the beginning of July. This wild card in both leagues is going to be something to watch. Atlanta won earlier today. So the Braves pick up a half game on Milwaukee for that second wild card spot in the National League. They're one game back. Pirates really hurt themselves by getting kicked around by the Cardinals here the last few days. But still. Two and a half back. That one in the air. And it's out number two. Meanwhile, over in the American League. You have three teams as well separated by game. Oakland lost again today to Seattle. So Seattle one game behind the Detroit Tigers. And the Tigers are losing in Cleveland 2 0 early that game in the third inning. As a rock off, fly ball into left field. This one will stay in the ballpark, and the inning is over. Red's gone in order. They're without a hit through the front four.
parking dollar ticket offer this weekend. The Reds will be back on the home front, and those home dates are precious and few now. You get four tickets, $48, receive a $15 Hawkbrow House voucher, and a 381 RE DS, or log on to Reds.com slash number four, word four, F O R 48. For the magic number, we're in the bottom of the fourth inning. Baltimore with a one-nothing lead. Orioles only have one base runner, and he touched them all. Jonathan Scope, a two-out solo home run to left center field in the third inning. That one fooled and fooled badly. David Lowe, strike one. Pitch to any of them in the lineup, they're going to take you deep. David Lowe's turn right here. He's a young man born in Akron, lives in Clinton, Ohio. That's just an example of what the Orioles did. If we talk about the composition of their roster. You know, they traded for David Lowe last year, last year in December, traded Danny Valencia and got him from the Kansas City Royals. I thought it was interesting, you know, Tom, when we were talking the other day, the first day we got in yesterday, went down on the field, talked to Buck Showalter a little bit. And of course, the first subject he brings up just about once he starts talking about Reds personnel is a role to Chapman. And the peculiarity of this particular series, in as much as that you have both closers on each team, the closer on each team is left handed. And of course, he wanted to talk about a role to Chapman. Well, the Reds are throwing the ball around the horn. They thought that was a swing and a miss on strike three. Adam Jones claiming he foul tipped it. And now the umpires are going to converge in front of the mound to talk about it. Didn't look like he touched it. It's hard to tell, really. But you see Mezzarocco making sure he holds on to it right there. That glove nearly falling off the hand of Devin right there. Okay, the fact that it did come off his hand. Looks like he has that tethered to his wrist. Here's the conversation, or at least the gist of the conversation that's going on out there with the umpires is well, this is what I got. Did you guys see anything else? And the home plate umpire is right on top of the plate, and they're going to call him out. And I'm not sure anybody else saw anything. Of course, you're going to get a visit now from the Oriole manager. I'm sure Buck Showalter is going to the home plate umpire and saying, wait a minute now. How in the world can somebody who is standing a foot and a half or two feet away not have a better look at it than somebody standing 110 feet away? Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the rare cases. You know, it's not a reviewable call. Looks like he did foul it. But it's not a reviewable call, but it looks like one of those rare cases where Buck Showalter wanted to get heated about this. 
And this would be an opportunity for a manager to, to throw a tantrum. You just don't see him like that anymore. Reds did not throw the ball around a second time. So you were starting to talk about two left-handed closers in this Yeah, and, and the whole idea is, is that Buck Showalter is saying, you know, we, we've got to play these games against the Reds, manage these games to keep Aroldis Chapman out of the game, period. Make sure we have a lead when we get there instead of hoping that we, you know, keep it close enough and then try to get something off of Chapman at the very end because he recognizes that is just simply not going to happen. And they were able to do that last night, barely. And you know the cynic out there would say well no kidding and you know really as a baseball manager you know what can you do to manage that well there are a lot of things you can do to try and manage against that mm -hmm. you know when you get situations whether it's bunting whether it's hitting and running while it's trying to do some things to get your team in a position to have a lead you're not guaranteed the manager can't make the pitcher hold the lead. But there are a lot of things you can certainly try and do differently to try and execute that game plan if that is your game plan going into a series. Well, I think part of his game plan was to make his players aware that that is the game plan that they have a role to Chapman out there in that bullpen. And until they had Jonathan Broxton traded you know they had a pretty good eight nine combination. So this is a seven inning ball game where you play the Reds. And that's what he tried to impress on his ball club to have a little sense of urgency early in the game. I tell you, there's a game going on right now at Dodger Stadium that may never end. That's the Nationals and the Dodgers. The Nationals had the lead. I beg your pardon. Dodgers had the lead going into the ninth inning. There's a rocket that nearly takes the glove off of Negron. And Nelson Cruz will post into second base with a one out double. Man, was that ball scalded off the bat of Cruz. This guy got hit. He was like one of the last free agents signed this year. Thought he was going to get big money over a long period of time. He ended up signing a one year deal with the Orioles, but he's having the kind of year that I think a lot of people are surprised about. You mentioned it last night suspended 50 games last year failed a drug test was off to a big time season last year. But that double by the way you think of all the great sluggers. Oh boy. Speaking of slugging that's Davis. Score this quick. You don't even have a chance to pick up the bullpen phone. Baltimore team leads the major leagues in clubbing the long ball, and that is their third one tonight. Mercy. You know, we were just trying to talk about Cruz when he had that double a minute ago. You think of all the great sluggers in Orioles history. He is the tenth player ever for the Orioles to hit 35 or more home runs and 25 or more doubles in a season. Well, they hit pay dirt with him. Kind of weird because it looked like Cruz was not even going to sign with anybody this year. The Orioles had been in spring training for six days by the time they finally signed him to a contract. Party on the ground ball to his counterpart, two away in the And with every day passing, that price went down a little bit. So they got him at a pretty reasonable rate.
you know, you just get the feeling watching the Orioles that they're not our cocky team, but they're confident and they just the way they carry themselves. They expect to play well. And Buck Showalter is using a, a different lineup tonight that he used last night. Some main guys are in there. You know, Showalter is a hard guy to get to know. His background is such a fascinating background when, when he grew up down in Florida. That's when school segregation was going on. His father was a principal at a school. And they started busing and so many people in that Florida community were against the whole idea. Of the races being mixed in a public school and, and his father came out and and said my son will go to school with all of these children regardless of color. And I mean he threw his youngsters right into the middle of all of that inside of their community. And it certainly made a mark moving forward in his life. I never knew his dad, Chris, but your chances are probably pretty good. He was a very stern guy and a firm guy and a disciplinarian when you have that kind of a job. And that's exactly what Showalter is as a manager. Well, evidently, his father was a good enough football player to have considered uh, to be an NFL fullback. Mm -hmm. Decided instead to become a high school coach instead. And administrator later on. In fact, uh, Buck Showalter was a teammate of mine at Meyer Leagues when we both play in the Yankee organization. Slow roller to the right side. Frazier will get it to Axelrod in time. It's a nice catch here. And Johnson retired to win the inning, but Thunder for the Orioles. They homer twice and now lead four nothing. Let's bring great dishes together by Toyota. For over 30 Toyota offers, visit buyatoyota.com and enjoy boneless Thursdays. That's tomorrow at B Dubs. Specially priced boneless wings all day. Buffalo Wild Wings, Wings, Beer, Sports. Well, right now, our AT&T call to action. You can tweet your photo using hashtag Ohio Fan Photo. Perhaps we'll show it during a game here on Fox Sports Ohio. So send them on in. Orioles have been sending him on out three home runs so far in this game for the Orioles against Dylan Axelrod. They have a four nothing lead. Of course the Reds were down five nothing last night before this man clubbed a grand slam. And in the ninth inning the Reds had runners on the corners. 
with one out and could not tie the game. One pitch, one out. For yeah. Jay Bruce. That play that ended the game last night was a very peculiar play. It was bang bang at first base. It was a moment there I thought that the Reds are going to ask for a replay and a review of the play at first base. So it turned out it was a double play ball. Remember Billy Hamilton on first base. Here it is. And Frazier hits it on the ground. Hamilton's on first base and he essentially runs right there into the out at second base. And they reviewed it over and over again. And I know that some of the coaching staff talked to Billy Hamilton and said, hey, Billy, you know, this is one of those situations where his speed got him in trouble and essentially ended that ball game because he thought he could outrun that play, get by the second baseman before that he was able to field it. Oh. I don't know if the catcher meant to do that or whether he lost his footing down there. Looked like when he hit the on deck circle, the uh, spikes went sliding out from underneath him. Yep. Well, he's lucky. Boy, you're not kidding. Well, he's lucky he didn't hit his head on that bar. Wow. But there were three options on that particular play for Billy Hamilton. One was to try to outrun the play, which is what he tried to do. The other was be to run into the guy after he fields a ball and make it unable for him to throw the ball like a Albert Bell did to right. Fernando Vina years ago, the old forearm shiver, right? And then the third would be the most logical play, just stop before the fielder got the point. Make the second base and make a decision to throw to first and then have the first baseman try to get the ball to the covering shortstop to get Billy Hamilton going to second on a tag play. That way, the, if he was safe, that way the run would have scored. Even if he had been the third out of the inning. Mm -hmm. That one hooked into left field, a base hit by Ludwig, and that is the first Reds hit of the game. But if you look at it from Hamilton's standpoint, he's probably thinking, I'm so fast, I can probably outrun this play. And that's the one instance where having that extraordinary speed probably worked against him and his decision making. Got to make that decision on the fly. And they talked to him about that today, and I think he's probably got a better understanding of how to handle that if that play ever comes up again, and I'm sure it will. You were starting to talk a couple of innings ago about the left field situation through the rest of this year and will we see much of Yorman Rodriguez pick that up where you left off. Well, you got three guys have been on and off out there all year. Heisey Ludwig and Schumacher. Schumacher will be back next year. I think he's on a two year deal. The other two guys. Heisey eligible for arbitration. Don't know what the story will be with him with the Reds will go to arbitration. Will they try to trade him? Will they sign him long term? Will they not tender him? Who knows? And then you have Ryan Ludwig who has an option for next year, a buyout, or you pick up his salary. And then you have Jorman Rodriguez. And Jorman is what, 22 or 23 years old? Yep. In fact, when he signed with the Reds at age 16, Ken Griffey Jr. was still playing center field for the Reds. Jay Bruce was a rookie. So he's been around the organization for a long time. Young man, they signed out of Venezuela at 16 years old. They brought him over here, taking him a while to get his feet on the ground. But he's an intriguing guy. And there are a lot of people who have watched minor league baseball a lot more than I've watched it and think that this guy might be worth taking a look at. He is out. Yep. Nothing you can do about that. That basically is like your shadow coming out of the batter's box. Now, if the ball hits you when you're in fair territory, batted ball, and he's in fair territory, and it hits his hand, and he's out, and he knows it. I think the catcher gets him put out there, right? Mm -hmm. So. The question is, are the Reds going to take the opportunity that they have here over the next month to take a look at a young player like Jorman Rodriguez on the big stage against big league pitching on a regular basis to find out whether this kid 
you know, is ready, or if he's not ready, how far is he away? We'll let you finish that thought when we come back. on Fox Sports Ohio. I'm Jim Day, guys upstairs talking about Norman Rodriguez, the uh, prospect in the Reds organization who is a September call up. The Louisville Bats, or excuse me, the Pensacola Wa Blue Wahoos played their final game on Monday. He was told he was coming to the big leagues after the game and it was a very, very big surprise. And of course, the one question I like to ask these guys is, what was the reaction from the family? He's from Venezuela, he called home, and said that his entire family he could hear in the background crying. It's been a long road for him to get to the major leagues. As you said, he's been in this organization for a while, but what an opportunity he might have this month. Can only imagine, really can't imagine. You think about maybe you have a 16 year old son or daughter at home. And all of a sudden they move away, not just move away, they move a long way. Well, away. 16, I mean, I, I know 18 year old college kids that go an hour away and get homesick. And their parents are really sick of them being gone. <laughs> and about them being gone. As Joseph is out or on about the fly them coming back. What's that? Or about them coming back. You see, you know, you always got to go now. You always well, have to. I'm trying to push the sentimental bunch of here. It's nice to get them out of the house. Don't you think? Well, you don't, wouldn't know that yet. I said to my Believe wife me. the other day, I'm going to be a basket case. How old is Good Luke? Lord willing, that day comes where the kids go off to school one day, you know? But I'm, I, you know, I mean, I will be a basket case. I'll be so bummed out. Well, you know, you think about it, you bring up a great point, though. A lot of kids do get homesick. The thing about leaving when you're 16. And still gone when they're 22. Well, not only that, but going to another country where you don't speak the language. There's a lot of a lot of adjustments you have to make, and baseball is probably somewhere down the list a little bit. Tapper down to Nate Grum, two away. And Chris is this is interesting right here after what happened a minute ago. But Showalter came out and told his bad boy get rid of these things. We're not going to have that happen again. Not only on our side but on the other side. I bet you those won't be used again this year. Must not be a government ballpark. I thought everything was government around here. Well, 
That's pretty quick action right there. I'm going to stay away from all that. You get me on my high horse, and I don't want to I, you know, make I've anybody got, mad tonight. I've already got the ground crew after me here. Which, by the way, you ran into today. I mean, after you basically called them out for double dipping and triple dipping in the Mexican food spread up here last night. One of the reasons they were huffing and puffing getting that. I mean, you were brutal. That was some spread. And they knew exactly who you were when that elevator door opened today here at the ballpark. Well, I, I was by myself. Press the elevator button, and there it is, opened up, and there was nine of them in the elevator. <laughs> I said, this is Tom Brennerman must have set this up. <laughs> elevator closed behind me. I couldn't wait. All I had to do was get two floors up. And I said, well, guys, you think you got to pull the tarp tonight? And they said, well, I don't know. We heard somebody was making some comments last night. And I said, that was my partner. I'm sure you did. And they said, we don't think so. We think that was you. And I said, guys, I just complimented you for knowing your way around a Mexican buffet. And no harm done. We're down in the field and saw them too. And we're all good. Sure. I think. All right. Well, you're here. So I'm here. They cut you a little slack. Great American Ballpark this Friday night. Arrive early, enjoy activities in the Kroger Fan Zone. Be one of the first 20,000 fans receive a Reds Irish necklace. Stick around for the big fireworks show afterwards. Thanks to Kroger and Home Team Products. 381 REDS for tickets. We'll look forward to seeing you this weekend. What's well, nice to see a familiar face. Very well known name around Cincinnati. Last name Sawyer. Dave Sawyer and his wife Dee. They're Kids Peter and Paige moved here a couple of years ago. They have so many great friends in and around the Cincinnati area. And Dave and Pete at the old ball game tonight. It's great to see. Reds have one hit through the front five. They're trailing four nothing. Baltimore hitting three home runs in the game. Hey Tom, we're talking about that Dodger Nationals game now going to the 14th inning. Still out in Dodger Stadium. They have used in that ball game a combined 50 players. That's what September call-ups will do. Tapper to short and just in time on a throw by Hardy. You know, we were starting to talk about that game, Chris, a minute ago. The Nationals had, well, they were down 2 0, coming to bat in the top of the ninth. They tie the game and then go ahead. Yep. And then Jason Wirt drops a fly ball in the outfield. The Dodgers tie the game in the bottom of the ninth. 3 3. 
Then it went to five to three nationals. Was that in the 12th? That w went to uh, five to three nationals in the top of the 12th when the Nationals scored a couple of runs and the Dodgers come right back in the bottom of the 12th yes. and score two more to tie it up. And now they are in the 14th inning. Remember that night in Philadelphia a couple years ago? Oh, you were yeah. there for 19 of them. Is that all was only one night? That was a long night. I saw where the anniversary was just the other day of the longest game ever played in Reds history. That was that game against the Giants. What 21 innings, mm -hmm. one nothing. That was just a few days ago, the anniversary of that game. By the way, if you're wondering what the record is for the most number of players to be used in one game, Mariners and, and the Rangers played a game in 1992 and they used a record 54 players. So they're not too far off there. They get through another inning or two of this one. That day, it's got a chance to break. It will break. You're talking about division leaders. You wonder how many players both of those teams brought up. I mean, how much do you really need? Nationals have a, a sizable lead. That is not the case. For the Dodgers. Five strikeouts in the game now for Gonzalez. Coming up tonight, and after every Reds game here on Fox Sports Ohio, Jim Day and company will break it down. Reds Live brought to you by Performance Kings Honda. Chris Welsh will be joining Jim Day, Jeff Pacoro. And Brian Giesen slow after the ball game tonight. Straight up in the air to be a one two three inning for Gonzalez. Low coming on and that's that. Baltimore in front for nothing. on Fox Sports Ohio. I'm Jim Daz. Give me an update on umpire Mike DeMuro who was hurt in the very first at bat last night when Billy Hamilton and he collided beyond first base. You look at the play last night. Now DeMuro said today that he's had previous back issues and with that in mind as you look he tried to brace himself so that his head didn't slam down onto the ground. He succeeded in doing that but he still had a whiplash effect. Left the game last night. They had three umpires do the game, the remainder of the game last night. He's not on the umpiring crew tonight. They are going to give him an MRI just to make sure he's okay. And we certainly wish Mike DeMuro a quick recovery. We sure do. That's scary stuff. I'll tell you that the umpire union, I shouldn't call it a union, it's a family. I mean, these guys all feel like they're brothers. 
And the funny thing is, we were waiting all night long for some kind of report about Mike DeMuro last night. Never got one, but if a player on either team gets injured, you know, it, there's usually some kind of report that comes out of the clubhouse because there's a PR director who's in charge of that. But there is no PR director for umpires, so we had to go down tonight and talk to Jerry Lane and find out what's going on. And they're all happy. I think that Mike DeMuro is going to be all right. It's good punt. That's good play by Axel Rod. Well, the only way you get that ball is Axelrod gets the ball and Todd Frazier hangs at the bag, and that's what they did. Frazier has to stay at home there. Axelrod has only allowed four hits, and here we are in the sixth inning. The problem has been three of the four have left the yard. Solo home run by Scope in the third inning. Solo home run by Lowe in the fourth, and then three batters later, a two-run home run by Davis. Oh, makes it a single. He's had Adam Jones' Jones number tonight. Two at bats, two strikeouts. Looking a lot like that right there. Pretty good crowd on hand here tonight. Wednesday night. Um, almost every person, it seems like, when to look around this yard, donning Oriole Orange. You like the, do you like the Orioles hats? Oh, classic. Hats. I mean, that is a, that's a good looking cap. Yeah. You know, there, there are just certain franchises you, you should never touch their hats. And in my very humble opinion, and I understand why they do it, the Reds are one of those franchises. Their hat should never change. It should be the red hat with a white seat. Yankees, all the time. Dodgers, all the time. Orioles, all the time. Boston, same thing. Those franchises should not touch their caps. I think there are some that shouldn't touch their white uniform. I mean, the Orioles are one of them. I think, yes. you know, cl the classic look of the Yankees pinstripes, the white Dodgers, even the, the white uniform of the, the St. Louis Cardinals. Ah, there's a single. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Chris, I don't know if you were a fan. I loved when the Reds home jerseys were the sleeveless jerseys. Yep. I, I do like that look. I really like those uniforms. But these are good looking caps. Rick Robinson looked good in both of those. Yes, he did. Looked a lot better in red. Posted some pretty good numbers in orange. Triple crown. Mm -hmm. Brooks Robinson, number five. Legendary manager there, Earl Weaver, number four. A fly ball and to right field for the second out of the inning. Draft players from every Reds game this season with MLB.com said to head challenge app. You and your opponent each select four different players. The person with the most points at the end of the game wins. That head challenge absolutely free to play, so download today. Talking about those retired jerseys. It's really nice to have you asked folks come up. You were talking about on the air last night from Iowa on yeah, this trip. The Huffs. Yeah, the Huffs from Cincinnati. Uh, started in Cincinnati, went to Pittsburgh, came here. They started in Dubuque, Iowa. Yes. And started then headed east. Yes. And of course they've watched a lot of minor league baseball. But they came into Cincinnati and you know they he picked the Reds a long time ago to be a fan of and Sam Huff is dragging his wife all over Tarnation watching Reds baseball. Well, 
Sam just bailed me out because I, I vapor locked here. We're looking at those retired jerseys out there, and I'm going through the ones I know there Robinson, Robinson, Weaver, 33, Eddie Murray, number eight, Cal Rifkin Jr., and I'm going 22. You know who that is? See, you're vapor Jim locking Palmer. too. There you go. Did somebody just give you the answer in your ear? Oh. No, I was yeah, a Jim you had Palmer that fan. Look like you had no, I was a Jim Palmer fan. I was told that when Jim Palmer first came up, he probably could have played center field. That's what kind of athlete he was. That's not what you were talking about last night. Last night I was talking about the fact he's the first man I know that got paid to walk around in his underwear. <laughs> Is there a second guy on that list somewhere? <laughs> no, no, I hope it's not. I'm going to leave you alone. I don't want you overexposed. Nothing, nothing. Bottom of the third inning. Solo home run by Jonathan Scope to make it one nothing. Then in the fourth, first batter low. Home run to right. After a one out double by Cruz, it's Davis the other way. Two run shot, three home runs. And that's been more than enough so far for Miguel Gonzalez. Boy, he's been awfully good and awfully efficient too. He has thrown only 63 pitches through six innings. So he starts the seventh inning quite fresh. In fact, main reason because he's done a lot of first pitch strikes. 15 of 20 first pitch strikes. And seven straight batters in a row now. First pitch strike. So he's going right after the Reds. And getting it done. Brandon Phillips to lead things off. Reds only two base runners in this game. That walk with two away to Santiago in the third, and the one out single in the fifth by Ludwig. That's it. Really, this is what Gonzalez has been doing pretty much outside of a stretch in the month of June. That's the only time this entire year where he has just not been superb when healthy. He spent time on the disabled list by the time they hit August. Went down, made one appearance down there before they brought him back up. But he had the bad stretch in June, but came back in July, made four straight quality starts. It's the second longest streak by any Orioles starter this year. And then after that run, he got hurt. Had an oblique strain. They sent him down 
to their double-A club in Bowie. Not too far down the road. Now, this is not an easy ballpark to pitch in. Chris brought it up earlier. I mean, maybe not quite the hitter's paradise, but it's among them. And his ERA at 3.3 in now 10 starts here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. 1 2. Popped up. Been a lot of that tonight. You know, and asking some of the scouts about Gonzalez, the one thing they said that he's not afraid to pitch up in the zone. He changes the eye level of the pitcher very well, and he gets the ball just above the hitting zone. You know, if you get it around waist high or thigh high, that's getting the ball up, and that's when you really get it whacked all over the ballpark. When you get it around the letters, it looks good, and if you've got a little carry on the ball, that's a pitch either foul off or you pop up. Never drafted, signed by the Angels as a non drafted free agent in 2005. And then the Boston Red Sox picked him up in the Rule 5 draft. And then he had a knee injury, went down to Mexico, recovered, had Tommy John surgery. So it's been a, a twisted road for Gonzalez to get here, and he's done pretty well here in the last couple of seasons. And there's one that is a deception. I mean, seemingly. Right down Broadway at 91 miles an hour, and he's throwing it right by a real good fastball hitter in Devin Mezzarocco. Nothing in two on the Reds catcher. And there's that high fastball you were talking about. It looks so good. Well, we like to do this with a Reds pitcher throwing it, but it's. Got such action on it. We'll call that our flamethrower of the night brought to you by Cholula hot sauce. Six strikeouts in the game one walk one hit allowed by the Oriole right hander and now the batter Jay Bruce who. Twice has bounced out to the second baseman is playing out in shallow right field in both times he was perfectly placed one time a rocket one hopper. And the other time, just a, a roller out to him. Cubs have jumped in front of Milwaukee. They're early on in that one. But Chicago with a two to one lead. And that game in Los Angeles, the Nationals have scored three in the top of the 14th. And to make it eight to five. You know, I'm getting some tweets from people that have that MLB package. Tweets? Yeah, you know, the not tweet texts. And uh, they're saying that the best part about that game in Los Angeles is getting to listen to Vin Scully for 14 innings. Yep. No doubt about it. Well, there's nothing fun for the Reds about facing Mr. Gonzalez.
big weekend coming up. Fox and Fox Sports 1. All right, Saturday, number 20, K-State taking on Iowa State. Then on Fox, it's a game everybody's talking about. Number 7, Michigan State. Taking on number 3, Oregon. Well, what a great matchup. Others will see BYU taking on Texas, Texas Tech, and UTEP. Saturday at noon Eastern on Fox Sports 1, streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Tell you what, I got to ask Mr. Pecora what he thinks about his beloved Kentucky Wildcats all of a sudden taking on the Ohio University Bobcats this Saturday in Lexington. The Bobcats came racing out of the gate with a conference win over Kent State over the weekend. You're on the monitor, on, or on the yeah, roll right I now. I believe it, brother. Frank Solich has done an incredible job at Ohio University. Four years in a row they've gone to bowl games. That's impressive. That he really has is. done a great job. He has recruited Cincinnati exceptionally well since taking over in Athens. Well, now taking over for Axelrod on the mound is a right-hander, Carlos Contreras. The Axelrod only allowed the five hits. Unfortunately for him, three of them home runs, leading to four runs in his six innings tonight. Did not walk a batter, struck out four. Uh, Contreras came up in late June and he stayed up and ran into a little bit of a problem towards the end of August and they sent him back down. But for the most part, especially his first dozen appearances or so, he was very impressive. The young man that the Reds picked up right out of double A. Comes in, throws strikes for the most part. Uh, but he's behind now three and one. He's only 23 years old. And he walks the first batter he faces here in the Orioles seven JJ Hardy. His first base on balls of the night given up by a Reds pitcher. Miguel Gonzalez walked one. Now he's falling behind the next batter, Kelly Johnson, two balls and no strikes. Well, you can't talk about how important these games are. Maybe not for the Reds as far as trying to, you know, win a playoff spot. Everybody understands that. But for guys like Carlos Contreras, and there are others, these are big games. You come into games and start walking, guys. Well, if you, if you come into games and start walking, guys, they don't call your number as often next time around. I mean, the Reds are not mathematically eliminated. They're still trying to win ball games and win them with the best personnel that they can put out there. And that's why Contreras is in the ball game right now, not because this is an audition. Although, in his from his perspective, it is an audition.
tell you, though, the crowd was a lot bigger than it is tonight. Just barely over 20,000. They make a lot of noise. Yeah, you know, there are a lot more people out there in the uh, the outfield seats, especially out there in the upper deck. Of course, school back in for everybody. A lot of schools back here don't start until after Labor Day, but it was the first time in a long time the Orioles have had a team this good. We mentioned they went to the one game playoff, won that game, lost in the division series two years ago to the Yankees three games to two. But I mean, this is the best team they've had at this juncture of the season, going all the way back to the 1970s. Well, they had some good teams in the mid middle 90s when they brought in a lot of big free agents. 2 and 0 now to count on Joseph. They lost in the what 96 LCS to the Yankees. 97, they had a good club, got to the postseason. But as far as where they are in the standings with this kind of lead, it has been a long time. Well, they have forever been outspent by the New York Yankees and Boston. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you right now that Contreras looks like to me he's pitching around the baseball, not staying behind it, is kind of turning his body and getting his arm on the outside of it. And he's talking to himself, trying to settle himself down just to throw a ball right down Broadway here and get a couple of strikes. Well, Brandon Phillips pretty much came out and, and yelling at Contreras. Throw the ball over the plate. Now cheerleading a little bit. That's good stuff. Center field, it'll back up Hamilton plenty deep enough for the runner to advance second to third. Throw comes into second base. Here comes a throw there, and he just did beat it. The heads up base running play by Kelly Johnson. And it wasn't like Billy Hamilton was lackadaisical right there. I don't think he was warned that he was going to warm heading to second base, but he didn't lob it in. I don't know if he was throwing it with the same energy he would have if he was trying to cut a run down at the plate. Almost looked like he had a hard time getting a grip on the ball because he had that little extra crow hop there. And in that case, that crow hop might have been the difference between safe and out. Yeah, I, have to field the, in. I have to ask the question because I'm not even sure of the answer. I mean, that ball was all the way to the warning track. Is that a, a situation where the shortstop as a cutoff man ought to get closer out into the outfield and a cut and a turn? Would the, can you get the ball there quicker if you did that? Good question. You know, I bet you if you were to go around and ask guys that are infield coaches on different teams, I bet you'd get different answers. Yeah, you might. Let's say, who's the cutoff man? Infield in, one and one to scope. That's good hook right there. That's the best pitch he's thrown in this inning. Well, he might come right back with it. You get this reaction out of a hitter. What you want to do is expand the strike zone a little bit. Start it on the edge and have it dive off. A 
Contreras walked the first two batters here in this Baltimore seventh inning. He gets an out, but they're at second and third. One two pitch. Missed away with it. And two Contreras ready, so to his scope, and here it comes. This will not get a couple of more to make it a six-nothing game. Scope has not been half the Oriole runs tonight. That guy has got some pop in that bat now. Well, he's got 14 home runs on the year, and this is only his second year in, in the major leagues. Had a cup of coffee last year with 14 at bats up here. Young man from Curacao, and been mighty impressive. Not a good outing at all by Contreras. Well, you walk the first two guys you face in the inning, and it's tough to pitch a scoreless inning when that happens. This will be our skyline chili call to the bullpen. J.J. Hoover will take over. AT&T. Wonder if Jim Day has a story about this photo. No, they're all hanging out of the house. Looks like maybe a birthday party or something. Kelsey, thank you. Runner in second, two runs home. Orioles lead the seven six nothing, and the pitcher now J.J. Hoover. Second year hiccup, of course, for Hoover after putting together his first full year in the major leagues last year, and he was mighty good. Really good. That's another thing that Buck Showalter was talking about that I, you know, we, we've heard from a, a lot of people, and he, he's not the first one to, to make this comment, but 
you know, we were asking him about his bullpen. Is there's a ground ball to short? And I mean, these guys have been great. We talked about last night how their closer, Britton, never had a save in his life, ever, in Pro Bowl. And now he's got 31 of them this year. He's only blown three. We were asking him about his bullpen. He said, look, it's not because anybody around here is really smart. He said, we have a bunch of guys that nobody thought could do anything, and now they're just out there doing it. He said, the question will become next year when we're counting on doing it, will they be able to do it then? And that's what happens to a lot of bullpen. You just don't know. That's not in reference to the elite of the elite. I mean, Aroldis Chapman is going to come back next year, and he's going to be throwing missiles and, of course, striking guys out. But talking about those guys that you're bringing in in the sixth and the seventh innings, oftentimes the eighth inning, unless it's a you know veteran guy like a Jonathan Broxton, former closer. Well, you look inside the Reds division alone, or the Reds team alone. Sean Marshall injured. Not been the same kind of year for Andrusik. Not been the same kind of year for Hoover. Well, Hoover really has put two good seasons together back to back before this year. Last year was his first year where he went as many games as he did. He pitched in almost 70 games last year, 69 overall. The year before that, at the big league level, 28. And I'm wondering if how much of it has to do with JJ trying to add another pitch this year. You know, really, primary pitches coming into the season were fastball, curveball. This year, he tried to add a little bit of a slider, and I don't know where that got. Sometimes, when you do that, it, it, you tend to combine the two pitches together, and they're not quite as effective. You know, you look at the, the St. Louis Cardinals issue. They had one of the most dominant bullpens in Major League Baseball last season. This one getting a piece of the bat. I mean, they were counting on Carlos Martinez and Kevin Segrist as a primary set of guys in front of Rosenthal to just dominate people. That has not happened. Segrist has been hurt a lot. Martinez had a move in the rotation and has really not found his way yet since coming back up from the minor leagues back in the bullpen again. Milwaukee, all the changes they've had over the last number of years in their bullpen. Doug Melvin has talked about that frequently, their general manager. Heck, look at the Pirates. This time a year ago, they were unbeatable after the sixth inning. And they have Melanson and Grilly and Watson and Wilson and everybody and his brother down there getting people out. Not been the same crew. Grilly's gone now. And Chris, speaking of Milwaukee, they are getting beaten again by the Cubs, six to one in the third inning. Well, don't look now, but the Cubs are right on the Reds' tail. Cubs are on the way, way to winning three in a row. The Reds are, if they lose this game, they'll have lost two in a row. Reds started tonight three and a half games ahead of the Cubs. There's a long way to go in that one tonight, but the Brewers, should they lose, that would be their eighth loss. In a row. By far the longest losing streak in baseball. 2 2 pitch. And JJ can't put this guy away. Lois lined out to center, homer to right. Tried to bunt his way on and. Axelrod made a nice play to throw him out in the sixth inning. And 
And this should end the seventh inning where the Orioles get two more runs. Thanks to back to back walks. Reds will bat in the eighth, trailing by six. Great prizes and perhaps be a part of the Reds live post game show. Join us this Friday at 6 and be part of the fun. I'm Jim Day. Ryan Ludwig has had a long career and played with a few different teams as he steps in to lead off this inning for Cincinnati. Outside of Minnesota's new stadium, finally he's played in every stadium. Camden Yards, Oriole Park here at Camden Yards was the only stadium in which he had not played a game in until. Tonight, the Reds have one hit, and it belongs to him. Oh. At 248, you know, you got to figure that Ryan wish he had a little bit more power. I'm wondering if really, you know, his shoulder didn't feel good until probably sometime into the season. You can ditto that really. I think Brian Price said it the other night about Chris Heisey after he hit a couple of home runs in Pittsburgh saying, hey, you know, you know, I know he hasn't done what he wanted to do this year, but there's time left to contribute when he hit those two home runs. Lubbock's power has been off. Of course, the Reds' power has been way down overall this year as a whole. Had a rough couple days here. And had a lot of English on it coming off the bat, but that is a straight up air right there by Davis. Well, he'd been playing third base quite a bit when Manny Machado went on the disabled list with that hip problem. He played about 15 games over there when he gets back here to first base. That must have come up on him because he was down on the ball. Hmm. Orioles committed a pair of errors here in the game last night. One of them by Davis. And there's a rocket into right center field off the bat of Schumacher. And the Reds have the first two aboard. That's only their second hit of the game. Ludwig owns the other one. It's a good short stroke right there by Schumacher. are going to bring up one of the players they brought up from the minor leagues. Oh no, I beg your pardon. I thought in we had seen that in the odd circle. Hanahan is going to bat now.
Jake Elmore waits in the on deck shirt. Jim Day reported just a minute ago about how Ludwig playing at Camden Yards for the first time. Here's a red that's probably played more games than anybody else on the roster in this ballpark. All of his years in the American League with Oakland and with Cleveland. Two and one the count. You see he's played uh, well, seven games here. And now two and two on Hanahan. Well obviously all those years in the American League Hanahan watched more games than he played in here in Camden Yards. Well, he's been here a lot. Two and two on Jack. Two on and nobody out. In the left center, low is there. That's out number one here in the eighth inning. Well, what a game Gonzalez has pitched here tonight. And again, all you hear about from people around when they talk about the Orioles, that, you know, do they have enough pitching to win in the playoffs? Here's all I know. And you know you look at most teams in the major leagues you know that category we started to talk about last night about scoring four runs or more. Nobody touches their numbers when it comes to scoring four or more which means their pitching is doing a really solid job of never getting blown out of the gym or having to win a bunch of games nine to seven or seven to five. I think the point that those people are making Tom is that when you play in the postseason you're facing another team's one and two sure getting four runs is an awful tough task. But again we asked a question last night when you start looking at the current teams right now that are eligible for the American League playoffs. When you look at those teams. Is there any number one starter out there. That scares you to death that plays for any of those teams. A legitimate number one stallion. Oakland? No. Angels? No. And I'm talking about not only a legitimate number one stallion, but a legitimate number one stallion with postseason experience. Yeah. Well, there are more in the National League. There's no doubt about yeah. it. I mean, so we've only seen him now for two days and probably won't watch another one of their games this year. But they are 62 and 14 when they find a way to score four. Well, this, four is, more. this is Jake Elmore getting his first shot as a as a Cincinnati Red. Young man that's been in the big leagues a couple of different places, made his debut with the Diamondbacks, and he's also played for the Houston Astros. He's an infielder. Heck, he is a one of a handful of major league players who have pitched and caught. Played pitcher and catcher in the same game. We're up in Pleasant Grove, Alabama, went to Arizona State eventually, and that's where he was drafted by the Diamondbacks. Been with three teams, three organizations this year alone. With spring training for the White Sox, designated him for assignment. Next day, traded to Oakland for money. End of July. Oakland turns him loose. Chris mentioned Reds claimed him on waivers. Went to Louisville. And now his Reds debut.
Well, Miguel Gonzalez has been doing that a lot. He's got eight strikeouts overall, and he's really done it pretty much with that fastball that he spotted all over the strike zone. He lets it rip up in the zone, occasional slider right there, and a splitter. But he has had the Reds eating out of his hand all night long. That is a Mazda pitch by pitch. Look at the Orioles' right hander. And now another Red making his debut. Not major league debut, but Cincinnati Reds debut. Jason Bouchois, one of 10 September call ups. He was one of the club's final spring training roster moves when he was reassigned to Louisville the day before opening day. He was the bat's most valuable player this season. Guy who's just waiting for that shot to get back in the big league. Led Louisville in hits, stolen bases. You see his numbers tied for the team lead in games played. Another guy that you just mentioned, like Elmore, Chris, play outfield, infield, play anywhere. Well, that was one of the intriguing things about Jason in spring training. They're looking at a lot of guys who were versatile. So it turned out it was Ramon Santiago that got the nod in that particular spot. And Bourgeois knew that when he signed with the Reds, he knew that it was an uphill climb. But he's very appreciative of the Reds giving him an opportunity to play, you know, Triple A all year long. Because remember, when you're playing in Triple A or even in anywhere in the minor leagues, you're not just playing for the team that you're playing on. You're playing for yourself too, because there are scouts at every game. That's why players get moved a lot in the off season. Originally drafted by the Texas Rangers in the year 2000. Will not go. They held the runner at third base. And you can understand that. I mean, you're down six to nothing. The last thing in the world that Steve Smith wants to do is have a runner thrown out at home plate to end the eighth inning. This is a right call here. And that's the pitching coach Dave Wallace out for a visit with Gonzalez. So congratulations to Jason Bourgeois. First hit. His first wearing a red uniform. And now Todd Frazier with the bases loaded. Mm. What happened in the eighth inning with the bases loaded last night? We can tell you the Reds were down five nothing. All of a sudden, you had a walk, you had an error, you had a hit batting. Dave Bruce came up and pow! Grand slam, third of his career to bring him to their run. Frazier almost played long ball back in the fourth inning tonight, sending Marcakis. Banging into the wall in right field. Orioles one more than the Red Legs. And this is going to end the end. Reds leave and loading. Orioles back in the eighth, leading by six.
with every game with Reds Live, presented by Racing Player Roofing, right here on your exclusive home for Reds Baseball, Fox Sports Ohio. Finale of the series tomorrow. Chris Tillman, there's another Baltimore starter, Chris, having an excellent year. Mike Lee having a good year as well. well Tillman's their top guy. That'll be a very good pitching matchup as Mike Lee's been throwing the ball very well lately. Reds will go back to their bullpen. And back to back nights, they will see a left hander. Uh, oh, no, it's not. This is not. not uh, Brian Danikins, David Holmberg. Holmberg's had a couple of games. Both of those have been starts for the Reds this year. Holmberg acquired by the Reds in a three team deal that sent Ryan Hannigan to Tampa Bay. Holmberg came over from the Arizona Diamondbacks. Nice job by J.J. Hoover. Face two batters, retired them both. And now Holmberg. Chris, you really liked that changeup that Holmberg was featuring when you first got a look at him. Reds have a lot of changes out there in the field. Tucker Barnhart behind the plate, Hanahan out first. Elmore at short. Todd Frazier moves over from first base to his natural position of third base. And Jason Bourgeois takes over in center field. Base hit right field by Adam Jones. Like to see just for the young man's, you know, psyche, if nothing else, for, for Holmberg to come out and, and at least taste a little bit of success here over the last month because his two starts have been rough. Really rough. One ball and one strike to Nelson Cruz. Well, that's a change of I think you're referring to right there, Tom. That's one that it's a good pitch if he can locate it. It's got to be pretty much on the spot. Runner advance on to second base. Be a pass ball charge to Tucker Barnhart. Good movement there. Three balls and two strikes now on Cruz. Three and two to Cruz. Winner at second with nobody out. 
Ball four. Saturday, a Major League Baseball doubleheader. A couple of good ones. Start with the Giants taking on the Tigers on Fox. Then the AL Central leading Royals will take on the Yanks. That'll be on Fox Sports 1. It begins Saturday, 12.30 Eastern on Fox. And then over on Fox Sports 1 at 4 o'clock, streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Yankees are winning their game tonight 3-1. To but every game becoming a huge game for the Yankees as they start play five back in the wild card. Of course, the Tigers playing big games every night because they are way back. Well, I beg your pardon. They are, uh, they're actually now the second wild card team, a game and a half better than Seattle, although that could be a half a game. Seattle's already won its game today. Quentin Berry now the pinch runner over at first. Reds have no action in their bullpen, so this eighth inning belongs to Mr. Holmberg. And it started with a single and a walk. Davis a two run home run. And coming back in the fourth inning. Fastball right down the middle. He took a 1 1 pitch for a strike. Struck him out. Good breaking ball there. Lefty on lefty. One out in the inning. Now you never really know what you're auditioning for if you're a, especially if you're a pitcher as a starter or a reliever. If you've got that kind of breaking ball, that may be something you put in your back back your mind if you're Brian Price or Walt Jockety and say, you know what? I like that lefty on lefty action there. Couple of former teammates growing up in um, San Diego out there on the base pass. Jones and Quentin Berry played high school baseball together. That's got to be pretty cool for those guys out there right now. One of them at second, the other one at first base. This will be an easy double play on that liner. Boy, they could have got three if they needed it. Reds will bat in the ninth. Trailing 6 0.
Miguel Gonzalez came walking out of the Baltimore Orioles dugout. He is getting a chance to do something he has never done in his major league career and it's not been a lot of major league games. We brought it up earlier. That's 71 major league games. But only one time. Has Miguel Gonzalez ever pitched a complete game in his professional career? And that was in double A, and that could have very well been a seven inning game. They play seven innings sometimes in a double header situation. Or it could have been an eight inning loss. Unless you're reading it uh, specifically different than that. No, I'm not. That was for the double A franchise in Arkansas, the Angels. He had the second best ERA in the league, the Texas League that year, was an all-star. But he is going for the complete game here tonight. And it's in there strike. He has been very impressive. He's been a strike machine. Walked only one batter. That was a two-out walk. The Reds' first base runner of the night. It came in a third. He had a misplay behind him. On the error by Davis in the eighth inning, he allowed a single, got a couple of outs, and allowed another base hit before getting Todd Frazier on a ground out when the Reds left the bases loaded. That has been their only threat of the night. No other inning in this game have the Reds had a batter besides the eighth, a runner, reach second base against Gonzalez. It's fan eight. Check swing and a foul ball, and Gonzalez ahead at one and two on Brandon Phillips to be followed by Meser. Uh, they took Meseranto out of the game. To be followed by Tucker Barnhart and then Jay Bruce. Shallow center field, low as air. Four dollars or four tickets, forty-eight dollars this weekend. That's the offer for the Red Legs and the Mets at Great American Ballpark. Four tickets for forty-eight dollars, and you receive a fifteen-dollar Hofbrau House voucher. Log on to Reds.com/slash four for forty-eight for more details. Ball one to Jay Bruce. Tucker Barnhart, I beg your pardon. Jay Bruce is next. Tucker batting for the first time since replacing Devin Mezzarocco. Good fastball in on his hands and just out of the reach of Flaherty over at third base. Something we talked about early in the game. Al Gonzalez likes to go with that high fastball to get guys to chase it. Tucker able to lay off. Gonzalez has fanned eight in that the one, game tonight. Yeah, that was just a little bit out of the chase zone right there. 
you know, sometimes you get into this part of the ball game and you feel like a guy might be legitimately getting tired. But if you've ever thrown a complete game in the major leagues, not only that, he's looking at a complete game shutout. There's plenty of adrenaline left. In fact, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to throw a complete game nowadays is that managers are so apt to take you out once you hit the 110 or 115 pitch mark. The eight strikeouts for Gonzalez tonight, a season high. His next strikeout, should he get one, would match his career high. He's been there twice. I know you were a little fired up the other day about Cole Hamels coming out of the game with a no-hitter. Um, I'm more fired up about his reaction to it. Now that's Chase on right there, and Tucker did not budge. Oof. Slide piece here. <laughs> Pretty good looking pitch. There's man. the time you should ring a rookie up on that one. Three two delivery. Okay, Tucker's up there doing all he can. He's going to make Gonzalez earn it. Now the Orioles have action out in their bullpen. This will be pitch number 110 for Miguel Gonzalez. One would imagine that if any runner were to reach base, Buck Showalter might come get him. We'll see. In the air, this will be out number two. Two nights in a row of Bud Norris last night. Six innings of four hit shutout baseball. Gonzalez here tonight. Trying to shut out the Reds. The Reds would score all four of their runs in a game last night against the reliever O'Day. But Gonzalez trying to record 27 outs in this one for the first time in his major league career. Strike one to Jay Bruce. I mean, he's shattering every personal best tonight. Hits a loud in the game. Longest outing in a game. He had never gone eight until this year. He's knocking on the door of a career high in pitches for a game, 114. That was two years ago. Two and one on Jay Bruce. Only four times in his career before tonight had Miguel Gonzalez in a big league game gone eight innings. And that's the longest he's ever been. And now trying to go nine. And he's a strike away. Center field a base hit. It's a six nothing game.
Buck Showalter's the kind of manager from the time I've been around him, Chris, and obviously he knows his team. This is not the kind of situation he wants to come get a guy out there no. on the mound. I, I mean, he would be public enemy number one in this ballpark if he goes after that mound right now. He's not even moving. In fact, he'd send Dave Wallace out there first. So Bruce with a two out single. Reds will have to score a run before he goes to get this pitcher. One with one of three in the game and a single back in the fifth. And this will do it. The point game shutout. The first in the career of Miguel Gonzalez. The first time since 2007 as a minor leaguer in the Texas League pitching for Arkansas and the only other time prior to tonight where Miguel Gonzalez throws a complete game. Now only the third complete game this year by an Orioles pitcher. That's how rare it is to see it happen. Well. Reds are going to have to reconfigure things and come back tomorrow to try to keep from being swept here in Baltimore. Big hug for Miguel Gonzalez. What a job. What a performance by him here tonight.